Okay, today we're going to talk about using a basis as a coordinate system for a vector space. We start off with the unique representation theorem and it says uh, suppose you have a basis B which consists of the vectors B1 through Bn and uh, you choose some x from the vector space V um, and the theorem says that no matter which x you pick from the vector space the there are a unique set of scalars C1 through Cn that uh, you can use to take a linear combination of the vectors in your basis to produce x. Okay, now um, so it's really saying two things. It's saying that that system's consistent. You can take a linear combination of the b's and uh, you can produce any vector in the vector space. And it's also saying that the solution to that system is unique. And uh, both these things follow from the fact that B is a basis for V. Um, the fact that um, it's a basis tells you that these vectors span V, so therefore that system is going to have a solution no matter what X is. And it also tells you that these vectors are linearly independent, and since they're linearly independent, the solution to that system will be unique, since there's no free variables. Okay, now the weights that we use, these C values, um, are called the coordinates of X relative to the basis B. Okay, and we write them uh, using your, your book's notation as uh, X with the brackets around it, this uh, notation here with a subscript B. Um, and we call that the coordinate vector of X relative to the basis B. Alright, so for example, we have a basis for R2 here, the vectors 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, just a, a quick aside, how do we know that that's a basis for R2? Uh, well, the simplest way is to say well, we know the dimension of R2 is 2, and here we have a set with two vectors that are linearly independent. And we know they're linearly independent because there's two vectors and neither is a multiple of the other. All right, so my question is, based on this particular basis, can you find the coordinates of the vector 0 or 1, 0 relative to this basis? So um, just setting up the system that we talked about previously, I need to take a linear combination of the vectors and the basis to produce x. And so we can set up that system in an augmented matrix and uh, solve the system. And uh, this tells us that uh, the numbers we're looking for are negative 2 and 1. Just a quick check. If we multiply negative 2 times the first vector plus 1 times the second vector, that gives us 1, 0, which is what we were looking for. So that tells us that the coordinate vector of x relative to b, which we write in this notation, is negative 2, 1. All right, uh, suppose we go the other way. Suppose you're given the coordinate vector and you want to find the uh, corresponding vector. Um, so in this case, all you need to do is uh, compute that linear combination. You have the coordinates. So it's, uh, in this case, be 5 times the first vector plus 10 times the second, and we uh, compute that to be 35, 50. Okay, um, this is a little bit of an aside, but kind of uh, leads us into what we're going to talk about next. If you have any vector, um, say just AB, um, then uh, the vector itself is the coordinate vector relative to the standard basis. So let's refresh our memory about what the standard basis is. Um, that's just the uh, for R2, just the uh, two columns of the identity matrix. Now your book refers to that as the uh, uh, labels that set with a script E. Alright, so notice um, that if you've got uh, a vector AB, then that's just A times 1, 0 plus B times 0, 1. So your coordinates are A and B. So therefore, the coordinate vector is just equal to the vector itself, right, which is just AB. So relative to the standard basis, the 
entries in a vector are actually the entries in the coordinate vector. Okay, so um, just a little review. If we have a basis um, and a coordinate vector, how do we find the corresponding vector? Well, we just uh, compute that linear combination. All right, so we know that uh, this linear combination can be written in uh, as a matrix times a vector. And so if we define this matrix, we'll call it P sub B to be the matrix consisting of the vectors and the basis, then this linear combination can be written as P sub B times the coordinate vector. And we say that P sub B is the change of coordinates matrix from B to the standard basis of Rn. All right, so we're taking uh, uh, P sub B, multiplying it by the coordinate uh, vector relative to B, and we end up with the coordinate vector relative to the standard basis, which, as we saw before, is just the vector itself. All right, so um, let's talk about how we go back the other way. If we're given a basis and a vector, how do we find its coordinate vector? Well, um, we uh, um, need to solve a system, right? Uh, take the linear combination, set it equal to the vector, and solve the system. We need to figure out what those multipliers need to be. So looking at it in matrix terms, um, we have this relationship, but we don't know what the coordinate vector is. So therefore, we need to solve the system for the coordinate vector. And one way to do that is to... Um, multiply both sides by the inverse of the uh, matrix and uh, that'll give us the coordinate vector. Now the the danger there is well how do we know that matrix is invertible? Well we actually do know that uh, it's invertible because um, we know that its columns are a basis for Rn and uh, so that's actually straight out of the invertible matrix theorem, but you can uh, kind of get there uh, um, in a couple of steps if you think, well, columns are a basis for Rn, so that means uh, that the columns must be linearly independent, which means there's a pivot position in every column, therefore n pivot positions. So uh, the matrix is invertible. Okay, so we're going to put those two ideas together uh, in this question. So here I've got two bases for R2. So bases, uh, that's the plural of basis. Uh, if you've seen that, kind of confusing, but bases is just the plural of basis. So we have uh, two bases for R2 here, we call them B and C, and I have a coordinate vector for a vector X relative to basis B. All right, so coordinate vector of x relative to b, which is this vector here. And I want to know how do we find the coordinate vector of x relative to c. Well, um, you can think of it probably easiest as a two-step process. So first, um, use the coordinate vector relative to b to find actually what x is. Right, and once you know what x is, then you can find the coordinate vector of x relative to c. All right, so we'll do those two steps. So the first one here, um, to find x, we just multiply uh, our uh, P sub B matrix, right, the matrix consisting of the vectors in B, times our coordinate vector, and we find that x is 2, 44. And once we know that, then we just need to take a linear combination of the vectors in C um, and set that equal to 2, 44 and solve that system. Okay, or uh, look at it like this, where we uh, solve the system by taking the inverse of that matrix times x. So here's uh, P sub C. Um, these are just the columns that are in the basis C. We invert that matrix, multiply by 244. So what we have here, I'm taking 1 over the determinant um, times this matrix times 244, and I end up with a vector 4, 2.
So this is coordinate vector of x relative to c. Now just to check, we can take that, these coordinates, uh, times our vectors in c, and see if we get x, which we do, 244. All right, so let's take, let's go back and take a look at what we did. All right, first step was to compute x, which we did by p sub b times x sub b, and then compute the coordinate vector relative to c by p sub c inverse times x. Now we can't put that all together, all right, just uh, plug in for x, and we have the coordinate vector of x relative to c is just p c inverse times p sub b times the coordinate vector relative to b. And so what we have is a change of coordinates matrix uh, from B to C. So this matrix takes us from coordinates in B to coordinates in C. All right. So PC inverse times P sub B is how we can change uh, B coordinates to C coordinates. All right. We're going to switch gears just a little bit and talk about polynomials. Um, let's uh, examine this problem. I want to show that these polynomials are a basis for P sub 3. Okay, this is actually a homework problem from uh, section 4.5, I think. Okay, so to show that these are a basis for P sub 3, we need to show that they span P sub 3 and that they're linearly independent. So um, let's start off and show that they're linearly independent. So to show any sets linearly independent, we have to take a linear combination and set it equal to the zero vector, or in this case, the zero element of P sub 3. So here's a linear combination, all right? C sub 1 times the first element, C sub 2 times the second one, so forth, equals, here's the zero element of P sub 3, 0 plus 0 times t plus 0 times t squared plus 0 times t cubed. All right, and we want to be able to show that, that the only solution to this system is that all the c's have to be zero. So the way to approach that is to collect uh, like terms, all right, collect all the constant terms, collect all the coefficients of t, and so forth, and then uh, equate those coefficients to what we have on the right-hand side. So we do that, we end up uh, with this, so this comes from, we've got C1 here, and then uh, from this term we get a 2 times C3, so that's our constant term. Uh, coefficients of T here, we've got a 2 times C2 from here, uh, and over here a negative 12 times C4, so that's where that comes from. For T squared, I've got 4 times C sub 3, and uh, for T cubed, i got an 8 times C sub 4. Oops. All right, so those are equal to this zero vector again. Now, uh, if you write out that system of equations, right, we're going to get c sub 1 minus 2c3 equals 0, 2c2 minus 12c4 has to be 0, and 4c3 has to be 0, and 8c4 has to be 0. So if you write that out, it looks like this, and when you look at it like that, it's obvious uh, that all the c's have to be zero, right? From the last equation, you get c4 has to be zero. From this one, we get c sub 3 has to be zero. And since both c3 and c4 are zero, then that uh, means that c1 and c2 have to be zero. All right, so we've shown here that the polynomials are linearly independent. Um, let's just look at it in uh, matrix form. Right? If we just look at the coefficients, uh, it's already in echelon form, and we have a pivot position in every row. So from that, we know that these polynomials must span P sub 3. So no matter what the right-hand side is, there'll be a solution. All right, so we have that they're linearly independent, and they span P sub 3, so they have to be a basis for P sub 3. Now, there's actually a somewhat easier way to look at this, um, and that is to, um, to look at the polynomials and what we ended up with in the columns of this matrix. Now, uh, actually the way it works is a polynomial of this form, here's a um, degree 3 polynomial, um, actually has a one-to-one -one correspondence with the vector in R4 that looks like this. 
Uh, first comes the constant term, then the coefficient of t, coefficient of t squared, and coefficient of t cubed. So for example, our polynomial, one of them was just 1, so that corresponds to the vector 1, 0, 0, 0, and R4. And if you look, that's what the first column of this matrix, our coefficient matrix, was. And then just to pick another one, how about the last one, negative 12t plus 8t cubed? All right, then that's going to have, that's 0 for the constant term, negative 12 for the coefficient of t, 0 coefficient of t squared, and 8 for the coefficient of t cubed. And that's what the last column in our coefficient matrix looks like. So the bottom line is that every polynomial in P sub n can be represented as a vector in Rn plus 1. Right. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between polynomials in P sub n and vectors in Rn plus 1.